Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. We are in part 43 of Sheikh Uthameen's tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah in the English language. Please go ahead and download the PowerPoint presentation in the video comments. Now we go back to verse 183. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, kutiba alaykum al-siyamu kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who have believed, decreed upon you is fasting as it was decreed upon those before you, that you may become righteous. The verse shows the importance of fasting because Allah has commanded it by way of an address. He was bin nida' لِأَنَّ Allah Ta'ala صَدَّرَهُ bin nida'. It is also a necessity of faith وَأَنَّهُ مِنْ مُقْتَضِيَاتِ الْإِيمَانِ Because the address is to those who have believed. The attribute of those who are being called as believers. And abandoning, abandoning it, <coughs> um, abandoning this kind of obligation is a deficiency of faith. And the verse of course shows the obligation of fasting because of the word kutiba. Kutiba, when something is written, it's affirmed. It also shows that previous nations fasted. It was obligated on them. That's why it says, كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مَقَبْلُكُمْ Just as it was obligated or decreed upon those before you. There's also a sense of facilitation because it makes fasting uh, easier since it was decreed upon those or on those who came before. This also shows the favor upon this ummah in that fasting was decreed upon it like those before and this gives it an elevated status just like those... Uh, before who were favored as such. <clears throat> it shows the wisdom behind fasting. At the end of the verse it says, لَعَلَّكُمْ uh, So that you may attain taqwa. You know, it shows the elevated status of taqwa and that one must make the means to reach it. That is why Allah has obligated fasting. The aim of it is taqwa. يَنْبَغِ الْإِنسَانِ أَنْ يَسْلُكَ السُّبَلْ الْمُوصَلَ إِلَى التَّقْوَى Anything that makes you reach taqwa, we should take it. Obligations and also things beyond the obligations. This also shows that a means to something has the same ruling than the thing as the thing itself, the same ruling as the thing itself. يعني ما كان ذريعة الشيء فإن له حكم ذلك الشيء. ذريعة يعني in Arabic it means that it's a means to it. So when taqwa is something obligated, then the means to it are also obligatory. That is why one must say must uh, stay away from situations and places of trials. وليهذا يجب على الإنسان أن يبتعد عن مواضع الفتن. One should not gaze at women who are strangers, for example, nor flirt with. Uh, a strange woman and talk to her in a way which is, which uh, arouses desires. It is because it may lead to zina. For example, another thing the Messenger وسلم, said or commanded, he commanded those who hear about the Dajjal, the Antichrist, to stay away from him and not put themselves in that kind of a trial, not to be overconfident and think that they can defeat him. The verse illustrates Allah's wisdom in making acts of worship of different types. Some acts of worship are purely financial. For example, zakah or general charity is just financial. Some are purely physical, <clears throat> the prayer itself. Others are a combination of both financial and physical. Hajj, because we have to pay to go and, 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 and incur traveling expenses. And also, we exert ourselves physically to do the rites of Hajj. Uh, some acts of worship are based on action. So prayer, for example, is just simply an action. It doesn't cost you uh, anything. Um, and it's just uh, you acting and, doing, and coming up with something. Others are based on abstinence. The opposite of an action is abstaining from something or staying away from something. Such as fasting, because fasting in and of itself means to abstain. At times, <clears throat> abstaining from what one likes is more difficult than actually doing something or coming up with something. So it is from Allah's wisdom to make acts of worship of different kinds. One might be generous and so giving zakah is very easy for him, but the test is not complete in that case. One might be very energetic, they might physically feel very light and very uh, you know, strong on their feet. So prayer is easy for him, even in the cold nights. Someone else might find fasting very easy, but giving charity for him is very hard because he loves money. Due to this, meaning that there's a variety of different acts of worship, some scholars have erred in giving a verdict that the penalty or expiation or what we call kafara for a king breaking his oath is to fast three days but not to free a slave. Yet, freeing a slave actually comes as an option before having to fast. They say it is because if the king has this option, it is easy for him to free a slave. He has the money to do it. He would free 10 slaves and not fast even one day. But this is not correct because the texts go against that. In Noble Quran, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, expiation is the feeding of 10 needy people, or clothing them, or the freeing of a slave. But whoever cannot find or afford that is required to fast three days. So fasting three days is in fact the last thing. So this shows that Allah is wise in making acts of worship of different types. In fact, freeing a slave is of a really high reward and would benefit the one being freed whereas fasting is mainly only for one's own personal benefit. So if you think about that, then it, it, it shows the benefit here. As for what we call in Arabic, al-masalih al-mursala, public interest, 
then the Sharia already covers those. And if one claims something to be done out of public interest, but it goes against the Sharia, then in reality there's no benefit in it. What is strange nowadays is that some people are patient enough to endure fasting in Ramadan, yet they don't pray. On the other hand, one who prays regularly will find it easy, but fasting would be more difficult for him because it's once a year. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then said in verse 184, let's review that verse. The verse shows the ease of fasting in that it is for a small number of days. It says, Fasting for a limited number of days. It shows that one should take the means to communicate in such a way as to ease matters because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used this approach to show that it's just a few days. So we should also use the same approach when we are uh, explaining to people the obligations of how easy they are. Allah's mercy is shown in that the days are not many relative to the rest of the year. It also shows in فَمَنْ كَانَ مِكُمْ مَرِيضًا The one who is sick can make up the missed days later. So it is permissible for a sick person to break his fast during Ramadan. Regarding a sick person breaking his fast during Ramadan, then there are three possibilities. First, it is that one is not affected by the illness, meaning fasting does not negatively affect him while he is sick. And fasting is not difficult for him in this sickness. In this case, one is to fast. The second possibility is the sickness makes is that the sickness makes fasting difficult on him, but the fasting itself does not harm him. In this case, fasting is disliked; it's makru. It's it, it's not it's, it's like it's, it's not disliked for one to fast while feeling a great difficulty in doing so. Um, but that that is because it is not for one to make matters difficult on himself. So it is disliked for one to fast while feeling great difficulty. That is because it is not for one to make matters. Uh, difficult on himself and things which Allah has given him concession and it, if one makes uh, matters difficult on himself it is as if he is rejecting the concession from Allah in Arabic it's a proverb it is said that one who rejects something from a generous person is one who is actually mean a lowly person a generous one loves that others use his concessions the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said inna Allah yuhibbu an tu'ta ruqasahu Allah loves that his permissions be practiced the third possibility <clears throat> is that the fasting harms someone who is sick, such as one who has kidney problems and requires water regularly. Here, fasting is actually prohibited for him. It's actually haram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَقْتُلُ أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ لَكُمْ رَحِيمًا And do not kill yourselves or one another. Indeed, Allah is to you ever merciful. In, in the verse is evidence that it is permissible to break one's fast during travel. The verse also shows that fasting is better due to Allah's statement. What? But this is not explicit in the verse. On the other hand, it is narrated in the Sunnah that fasting was done during travel. The Messenger ﷺ used to fast during travel, and some companions also fasted while others broke their fast. And none of the two parties blamed each other. And regarding fasting during travel, then there are also three scenarios, just like when we're talking about someone who is ill or sick. The first scenario is that there is no difficulty in the travel whatsoever meaning it does not cause more difficulty than it would on one who is not traveling. Otherwise, there is some difficulty in fasting even for a resident. So fasting does have general a general challenge, but we're talking about something beyond what a resident feels. Here it is difficulty beyond what a resident would feel. In this case, fasting is better. But if one breaks his fast, there is no blame on him. The evidence for this is that the Messenger wasallam used to fast during travel. And this is the madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i. But what is more well known in the madhab of Imam Ahmad is that fasting is disliked even in this scenario. The reasoning here is that is Allah's statements when he says, فَعَدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامًا أُخَرٍ And the Zahiri school's opinion is that fasting is actually haram in this scenario. It's prohibited. And that even if one fasts, it does not exempt him from having to make it up. From the same proof that they use, فَعَدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامًا أُخَرٍ Because Allah obligated fasting other days. That's how they see the verse. But this is a very weak opinion, as is the famous opinion of, of the Madhab of Imam Ahmad. The second scenario is that fasting is difficult on the traveler, but that the difficulty is tolerable, it's, you can manage it. So in this case, breaking the fast is better. Uh, the evidence is that the Messenger وسلم, was traveling and he saw a crowd and a man who had been put in the shade, in the shade from the crowd. So he وسلم, asked about this, his situation. So he was told that this man is fasting. So he said, لَيْسَ مِنَ الْبِرِّ الصَّوْمُ فِي السَّفَرِ Fasting while on a journey is not a part of righteousness. So the Messenger ﷺ negated bir from that. It is known that 
in, in you know in the usul in the foundations of fiqh that we say al ibratu fi umum al lafz la bi khusus al sabab consideration is taken from the generality of the text not the specific reason for it the statement of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is general but the cause in the narration as it seems is specific يعني ليس من البر الصيام في السفر هذا عام والسبب خاص والمعروف أن عبرة في عموم اللفظ لا بخصوص السبب. So the question is, what is the explanation for this principle and this hadith? If we say that we're taking, we're considering things, the statements of the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم or the Quran, Allah سبحانه وتعالى's words, in the general sense and not just to the, to the specific circumstance. How do we explain that in the hadith where we have a specific circumstance of someone? Um, who was told basically that there's no bir in fasting in this kind of a general statement yet his situation seemed to be specific for him we are saying that it is better to fast during travel if traveling does not cause difficulty right so it's better to fast during travel if traveling does not cause someone difficulty now what is meant by al khusus al aini is an al ibrata fi umum al la bi khusus al sabab so al ibrata fi umum al lafz la bi khusus al sabab has to do with al khusus al aini the principle that consideration is based on the generality of the text and not the specificity of the cause is with regards to a specific scenario. This is what we're talking about here. The khusus here is a specific scenario. Uh, and it is in reference to al-khusus al-ayni for a specific scenario of a given person. Not a specific description. La al-khusus al-wasfi when you describe the situation of someone which would apply to other people. A specific description or an attribute of a specific situation is definitely taken into account. The description is taken into consideration in the general sense. So in the hadith, regarding the man who was put in the, in, a, in a shade, it is not said that it, it doesn't say there is no bir in your fasting during travel for you specifically, meaning you, this man. For you specifically, there's no bir. It doesn't mean just, just, just for him. Had this been the case, had this been the case, then the general would have been specified due to this reason, meaning the man himself. However, الخصوص الوصفي لا بد أن يقيد به العموم. A specification based on a description or an attribute of the situation must be restricted by what is general, meaning the general attribute in that situation. فيكون المعني ليس من البر الصيام في السفر لمن كانت حاله كهذا. So what would be meant is that it is not bir to fast during travel for one whose situation is like the situation of this man. So this is the generality we're talking about. It's not just about this man specifically. So the generality is for anyone in the situation of that man, not only for the man mentioned specifically in the narration. So it is still general, and the statement of the Messenger وسلم, is taken in the general sense. So if someone claimed that this narration is just for that specific man, then the answer would be, So this is where the principle comes in. The crucial factor is the general meaning of the narration, not the occasion in which the narration is covering, per se. Ibn Daqiq al eid explained this principle in the context of explaining the affirmation hadith in his Ihkam al-Ahkam, Sharhu Umdat al-Ahkam. Generality, as we say, or al-Umum, is Umum al-Wasfi, a generality that is based on a description or attribute. Or it is a Umum al-Shakhsi, a generality based on a specific person. فهنا العبرة بعموم اللفظ باعتبار الشخص أما باعتبار الوصف فإن الحكم يتعلق بسببه الذي من أجله شرع الحكم In the latter, which has to do with the description of the attribute of the situation The generality is by considering a specific person Whereas consideration is based on Whereas consideration based on the description Is what a ruling is attached to And due to it, a ruling is established So the general situation, not the specific person So علة الحكم the defining factor for the ruling here is difficulty in fasting during travel that one in such a situation would break his fast because there is no bit in fasting in the situation to make things basically harder on himself the third situation is very extreme difficulty in fasting during travel such that it is actually unbearable in this third situation breaking the fast is specified to particular people that have a particular circumstance the evidence for this is during the journey of the conquest of Mecca, the companions came and said to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that fasting has become very difficult on people. Yani the hadith is in the Nasa Qad Shak Alihim Siyamu wa in the Nasa and Duruna Evan Pima Fat. Fadaa Bikadahin bin Ma'in Badal Asri Fa Shariba wan Nasu Yan Duruna Elayfa Fa Aftara. Fa Aftara Baduhum Wasama Baduhum Fabalahu and Nasan Samu Fakal Ulaikal Usa. 
So he was told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the fast has become difficult for the people and they are watching you to see what you will do. So after Asr, he called for a cup of water and drank it while the people were looking at him. Some of them broke the fast while some of them continued out their fasting. It was conveyed to him that people were still fasting, so he said, those are the disobedience. So this is, we're talking about um, general pe- generally, generally everybody is feeling a difficulty. And an act of disobedience is regarding, because Rasulullah said, Ulaika al those are the disobedient. An act of, of, of obedience, of disobedience, is regarding a matter which is prohibited, disobedience. So if one is so if one is facing unbearable difficulty while fasting during travel, then he must break his fast. Another benefit, and the hukm mu'allakhun bima yusamma safaran biduni taqeed. The ruling is based on what is termed as travel, without restriction. Yani as safar al-ladhi yubaha fihi al-fitr, غير مقيد بزمن ولا مساحة. Travel in which breaking the fast is permissible is not restricted to a duration or distance. That is because it is mentioned unrestrictedly. It says أو على سفر. It doesn't say the safar how long is it, or for example how far it is. But some scholars said that the travel must take a day to complete, because the least of for which one can break his fast is for one day. So obviously you fast for a full day. So if your travel takes at least a day or more, then you break your fast. Otherwise. Uh, the, you know, so the, the travel must actually encompass a day. In this case, if one heads out at the beginning of the day but returns the same day, you know, before before the the day is over for of the fasting, then he's not to break his fast. The next thing we have here, <clears throat> Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فما شهد منكم الشهر فليصم وما كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يرد الله بكم اليسرى ولا يرد بكم العسرة ولا تكمل العدة ولا تكبر الله على ما هداكم ولا علكم تشكرون the month of Ramadan in that in which was revealed the Quran a goddess for the people and clear proofs of goddess and criterion so whoever cites the new moon of the month let him fast it and whoever is ill or on a journey then an equal number of other days Allah intends for you ease and does not intend for you hardship and wants for you to complete the period and to glorify Allah for that to which he has guided you and perhaps you will be grateful. Now, the term or the time period between two crescents is referred to as a shahr. So shahr, ishtihar, they're, they're very close to each other, those two words in Arabic. It was referred to as such due to it being, uh, due, to it, due to its distinction. Kind of like a famous distinction that the month is known when it starts and when it ends. And that's what ishtihar is as compared to the word shahr. So due to the month being based on the fact that it's witnessed famously witnessed by people the scholars deferred many of them deferred um, as to whether a crescent is one which occurs behind the horizon even if it is not seen or is the crescent what has been seen like witnessed by by an individual uh, the correct is the latter is that it is based on what's seen the crescent merely becoming as such but not seen is not a basis for legislative ruling until it is seen verified and witnessed shahr ramadana the word shahr is what we call mudaf in Arabic, what is added or attributed to something else. And Ramadan is the object to which it is attributed, which is a proper a proper noun. Uh, the word Ramadan is what we call in Arabic mamnu'un min as-sarf. There is no tanween at the end of it because it is a proper noun and because of the letters alif and noon. Uh, so you can't say Ramadanun or Ramadanan or Ramadanin, you can't do that. Um, it is taken from the word ar-ramd, and there is there are different views <coughs> regarding why it is referred to as such. لأنه يرمض الذنوب أي يحرق يحرقها because it burns out sins. That's one uh, one of the two explanations. The other one وقيل لأنه أول ما سميت الشهور بأس بالشهور بأسمائها صادف أنها في وقت الحر والرمضاء. It was also said that when months were first named. Uh, this month was during the extre- the, the, the time uh, of extreme heat, and this opinion is closer to being correct because much because such a naming was before Islam actually, so it was based on the heat and not the fact that it burns sins. وقوله شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن خبر مبتدأ محذوف تقديره هي أي الأيام المعدودات شهر رمضان يعني هي شهر رمضان. Allah's statement, the month of Ramadan, in that in which was revealed the Quran, it is a predicate with an omitted subject, which is its description as being a limited number of days, meaning the limited number of days is the month of Ramadan, which was mentioned in the previous part of the verse. 
The Quran was revealed in it. Does the Quran refer to the genre, al-jins, such that it refers to some of it? Or what is meant is the Quran in general, such that it refers to the to all of it, the entirety of it. Some scholars said that it is in general, in the general sense, so it means the entire Quran, and this is in, this is the famous opinion among many Mufassirun, many explainers of the Quran. The issue here is that the Quran was revealed during all months, though. That's the thing about it. Uh, we know that it was revealed not just in Ramadan, but it was revealed in other months as well. Uh, 23 years to be to be exact. But those scholars said that uh, it has been narrated from Ibn Abbas in order to, to prove this opinion that the Quran was brought down from the preserved tablet Allah al mahfuz to the House of Honor and Baytul Izza uh, during Ramadan, and so Jibril would take it from the ha- from that house, yani Baytul Izza, and would descend it descend with it to the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. However, Shaykh Al Taymin stated that, that this is a weak narration, uh, and this narration is in, in the Hakim is Mustadrak ala al Sahihain. Um, which you, as many of you might already know, uh, as Al-Hakim, he included narrations based on the terms of Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim that are not in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, in his, what's, what's called Al-Mustadrak, ala sahihain So what is correct here is that alif, the Alif Lam in Al-Quran is for the genre, not for the generality. وَلِهَذَا الصَّحِيحُ أَنَّ أَلْ أَلِفْ لَامْ هُنَا لِلْجِنْسِ وَلِسَةُ الْعُمُومِ وَأَنَّ مَعْنَا أُنزِلَ فِيهِ قرآن أي بدئ إنزاله كقوله إن أنزلناه في ليلة مباركة وإن أنزلناه في ليلة القدر. And uh, so what is meant by by in which was revealed the Quran, يعني أنزل فيه القرآن, is that it began to be revealed. It began the beginning of it. Examples are given such as indeed we sent it down during a blessed night, indeed we sent it down during the night of uh, decree. And the word unzila means something descended from above, and that is because the Quran is Allah's speech, and Allah is above the heavens over His throne, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word Al-Qur'anu is a masdar, it's a verbal noun, just like Al-Ghufran, Al-Ghufran. It is either bima'na ism al-fa'il or bima'na ism al-maf'ul, a noun taken from the aspect of the doer of the action, or something itself that is done. As for ism al-fa'il, يعني the one who is doing it, al-qari' يعني al-jami' لأنه من قرأ بمعنى جمعه. It means it's referring to the one who is doing the reciting, because in Arabic it means to gather something. You know, qara'a يعني جمعة to gather something, because reciting in Arabic means to gather something together. Women who qariya لأنها مجمع الناس. The word qariya in Arabic is also related because it is what gathers people together. So qara'a qariya, you can see the similarity between the two. And uh, as for the other one, اسم المفعول, meaning something that's done, uh, as opposed to the one doing it, then it would mean المقروء. What is recited? The Quran itself, and both meanings are correct. A guidance for the people and clear proofs for guidance and criterion. The word, uh, this word huda is taken from hidaya, hidaya, and it means guidance. The Quran is a guidance for their religion and livelihood. And hudan lin nas is general for all people. All people use it for guidance, believers and disbelievers alike, because it it it, it it's a proof and it shows the guidance. That is, this is the guidance of knowledge, what we call al-hidayatul almiya. As for the practical guidance, al-hidayatul amaliya, then it is hudan lil muttaqin, as stated in verse two of Surah al-Baqarah. Uh, so it is hudan in terms of knowledge for everybody, but as far as practical guidance acting upon the knowledge, then that's a different story. It's for the muttaqun, a guidance for the muttaqun. For the muttaqun, it is both guidance for knowledge and practical guidance at the same time. And hudan is either maf'ul min ajlihi aw hal min al-Qur'an, an affected subject, unzil uh, lihidayat al-nas, that it was revealed in order to guide the people, yani maf'ul min ajlihi for this purpose, or that it is a hal, a state, anzal unzil hadi al-nas. The Qur'an was revealed as a guidance for people, so one of them is to guide the people, right? Meaning it's doing something, and uh, or the uh, the other one is. As a guidance for people, and it's a had it's in itself the, the the state of the Quran is that it is guidance. The latter is closer to being correct because of what comes after it. and clear proofs of guidance and criterion. So it, meaning it's 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 the hal of it or the or the, the the state of the Quran is that it is guidance. And the word nas is originally al unas al unas, but due to its rampant use, the hamza in this word was dropped, so it becomes an nas. 
So it is not just guidance, it is guidance with proofs because bayinat is both proofs and evidences. al barahina wal adilla we say in Arabic. وذلك لأن طريق الهدى قد يكون يبين الطريق فقط لكن ما يأتي بالحجج والبراهين الدالة على صدقه لكن يعني ما يأتي بهذا doesn't come with that that is because the way to guide us might just show the way just the direction but may not come with proofs and evidences proving that it proving its truth the Quran gathers between guidance and proofs so not only is it guide you and show you the way but it proves to you that this is the way فالقرآن الجامع بين الهداية وبين البراهين الدالة على صدق ما جاء فيه من الأخبار so the Quran gathers guidance and proofs that point to the truth of what came in it of news, of what, what is to come, and the justice of what came in it in, in, in it of legislation. Guidance and criterion is an attribute of the clear proofs. This word Furqan is a verbal noun, just like we saw in the Quran and Furqan. Both of them are verbal nouns. Uh, and you have Furqan, you have, for example, Farraqa, Yufarriqu, Tafriqan, and Furqanan. These are the different derivations of this word. So the Quran separates between truth and falsehood, good and evil, the beneficial and the harmful, um, you know, that kind of thing. So the one who has been guided by the Quran finds a great difference between truth and falsehood, but the one in whose heart is deviation, Zayr, will be confused and things will be unclear for him. And from Furqan, is that the Quran separates between reward and punishment. Most of the time reward is shown in detail, whereas punishment is explained in a summarized manner. Whoever cites the new moon of the month, let him fast it. The word shahida means that, that someone cited shahida. The other, the other mean, the other meaning is that he was present. Hadra, he was, he happened to be there when, when it took place, when it occurred. According to the first meaning, there is an issue because what comes after it is a shahr, a shahr. As if to say that someone cited the month. It is because a month or a shahr means the time period between two crescents, and a time period cannot be cited. According to the second meaning, it is. Whoever is present for the month or you know witnessed the, the fact that the month you know is 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 is, 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 is upon him should fast it. There is no issue in this in the second case. As for the first explanation, the scholar said that shahida comes from a shahada. They said that it does not mean that one is present during the month. They said that that month is that that month is estimated to be Whoever from you witnessed the crescent of the month should fast it. The word shahr is ala taqdir mudaf that something is added to this word shahr and the word hilal is what is what is added mudafun ilayh or that the word hilal is from the aspect of tajawuz tajawuz that the word month is symbolic of the crescent it's figurative from the word majaz however the second opinion is more correct that what is meant by shahada is hadara and what makes this opinion stronger are two matters first it is to do with the text itself the lovely meaning the literal text itself. In this case, there is no need to estimate the numerated word nor use metaphors. And The second is that during the actual time of the month occurring, there are places on earth in which the crescent is not cited, such as in polar regions. Months would go by and nobody would cite any crescents. So if it had to do with citing it to the crescent, then people in those regions would not fast at all. So if we say it means hadara, that someone is present when the crescent is cited, even if he himself doesn't see it, then the meaning would be general and would cover everyone, even those who don't see the crescent. So in this case, if shahr means the time period between two crescents and hadara means that someone is present, then for people who are living in those polar regions, they would fast based on the timings of the equator, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the middle part of the earth, or according to the sighting in Mecca or according to the nearest country to them. And these are three opinions. And this is a matter of ishtihad, juristic reasoning, and what is most correct is that they would go by sighting, by the sighting of the crescent based on the nearest country to them, because geographically it makes the most sense that it's close to them. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِكُمْ الشَّرَفَ الْيَصُمْ أَيْضًا تُعْيُدُ الْقَوْلَ الثَّانِي إِنَّ الْمُرَادَ شَهِدَ يَعْنِي حَضَرَ لِأَنَّ الْهِلَالَ لَا يُصَامُ وَلَا يُصَامُ الشَّهْرَ And the latter part of the verse, that whoever witnesses the month should fast it, this supports the second opinion in which there is no estimated omitted word or metaphor, 
because the crescent is not what is fasted. Rather, the month is what is fasted. You fast the month, not the crescent. The time period that is between two crescents, so it is that one is present, hadara, during that time period. فَلْيَصُمْهُ He should fast it. That is explained by what comes later, because one does not fast the entire month, its days and nights, as fasting is during the day, not during the night. However, when fasting was obligated in the beginning, if one slept after Maghrib, after sunset, without breaking his fast, he was not allowed to break his fast until sunset of the next day. But Allah lightened the ruling as will come later in the explanation of the verse. There is the hadith in which the Messenger وسلم, said, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُوهُ فَصُومُ When you see it, meaning the new moon, observe the fast. This does not support the first opinion that the verse means witnessing the crescent itself. Uh, the narration is about the timing. The Messenger وسلم, clarified the timing of the fast, that fasting begins when the month itself begins. I will add that it says فَصُومُ in the hadith. It does not say فَصُومُهُ because the fasting is to fast the month, not the crescent itself. Because if it said the رَأَيْتُمُهُ فَصُومُهُ then you would think that it would be talking about the crescent itself. And, and this is what the Sheikh was talking about, that we're talking about being present when the month starts. Not that, that you don't fast the, the crescent, you fast the month, the, the period of time. وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعَدَتُمْ مِنْ يَمَنْ أُخَرٍ The same sentence came before regarding the sick and the traveler. We saw this in the previous verse, but it was repeated after فَمَنْ شَهَدَ يُكُبُ الشَّهَرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ so it was repeated so that one does not think that this verse abrogates the previous one, such that even the sick and the traveler has to fast Ramadan. So the second, the second part of verse 185 is to emphasize the concession. It, uh, it is that even after fasting has been specified to Ramadan, the concession still remains. This is from the eloquence of the Quran, what came in verse 185, after what came in verse 184, is not mere repetition. The repetition is for a benefit. If verse 185 only said, then it would have then it would have abrogated what came in verse 184, so that even the sick and the traveler has to fast. Allah intends for you ease and does not intend for your hardship. This is the reasoning for وَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ رِضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ And whoever is ill or on a journey. This is where the Yusr comes from. And the word يُرِيدُ is taken from the word irada, To wish or to will something. يُرِيدُ is a present tense verb. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes and wills. It is of two types. إِرَادَ كَوْنِيَّةِ وَإِرَادَ شَرْعِيَّةِ A universal will and a legislative uh, will. The universal one has to do with this, with his decree. His, his يعني, تقدير, measuring. For the other kawniya bima yata'alla ma yata'alla bi taqdirihi subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the legislative one has to do with his sharia'ah, or the iratat al-shari'ah ma yata'alla bi shari'ihi. The universal will has to do with al-mashi'ah, his will, what he wants to, to see happen. The legislative wish has to do with al-mahabbah, what he loves and is pleased with something. When, when, and is pleased with something. So Allah's statement, walakin, walakin Allah yaf'alu ma yurid, for example, we have that in Surah Al-Baqarah, but Allah does what he, what he intends, is the same as, Allah ma yasha, and Allah does what He wills in Surah Ibrahim. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهِ يَفْعَلْ مَا يُرِيدُ وَيَفْعَلْ اللَّهِ مَا يَشَاءُ Basically the same, the same meaning. So in the verse we are discussing, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ بِكُمْ وَالْيُسْرَى This is al-irada shariya Right, this is the legislative will. So it means that Allah loves for you ease. يُحِبُّ بِكُمْ الْيُسْرَى It is not al-irada al-kawniya, universal will, because had it been so, then nobody would face any hardship whatsoever. This would not be in line with فَإِنَّ مَعَ رَسُلُ يُسْرَى For indeed with hardship will be ease as we read in Surah Al-Sharh. Due to that, one does not find hardship in the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even in the legislations of previous nations, there was no hardship except due to their actions. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Bani Israel in, uh, in, in, in Surah Al-Nisa. فَبِظُلْمٍ مِنَ الَّذِينَ هَادُوا حَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْبَاتٍ أُعْلَتْ لَهُمْ وَبَصَدِّمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِ لَهَا كَثِيرًا For wrongdoing on the part of the Jews. That's the reason. We made unlawful for them certain good foods which had been un had been lawful to them and further averting from the way of Allah many people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant us victory over them. Otherwise, Allah's legislations are inherently founded upon ease. Al-asl, yani al-suhula or al But in some instances, there might be difficulty. For example, one might be deprived of certain good things from the aspect of universal prohibition. In a tahrim al Certain good foods might be harmful for certain people due to diseases. So somebody, for example, cannot have sugar because they have diabetes, for example. So in summary, we have uh, al-irada is shari'iyya wa kawniyya. 
whatever has to do with creation and measure is universal will and the sharia has to do with legislative will another sharia be man al mahabba what other kawani be man al mashia legislative will means the love for something to be and universal will means that decree that will happen no matter what the second thing about it is al irada kawniya la budda fiha min wuqu' al murad what other sharia qad yaqa wa qad la yaqa universal will must happen whereas legislative will may occur or may not occur so Allah wants from us that we obey Him. Some will do that and others will not. The third distinction between them is that uh, Legislative will is only that what Allah loves. When He legislates something is what He legislates what He loves. But universal will might be what Allah loves or doesn't love because it has to do with the universe and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's measure of things. Things He loves or doesn't love. All things are decreed by Allah. For example, the disbelief of Abu Jahl is part of universal will and it is so because it occurred. But it is not legislative will because Allah does not love that. Allah does not love this belief. The belief of Abu Bakr is both universal will and legislative will. Universal because it did occur and legislative because it is what Allah loves. Allah loves belief. But the disbelief, quote unquote, of Abu Bakr, we know it never happened, but as Sheikh is saying hypothetically, is neither universal will nor legislative will. So it is not universal will uh, because it did not happen. We know Abu Bakr was you know, the top Muslim, the top believer after the prophets. And not legislative because it is not, and, it, and, it, and, and, it is, uh, and, and, and his and his disbelief is not legislative, if hypothetically, because it is not what Allah loves. Allah does not love kufr, does not love kufr. As for the belief of Abu Jahl, quote unquote, Abu Jahl never believed, we know that. It is not universal will because it did not happen. Laysat kawniyya. But it is legislative will because Allah loves belief, even though He didn't believe it. Allah loves belief. يعني مراد مراد شرعا لا كونا مراد شرعا لأن الله يحبه لا كونا لأن الله تعالى لم يقدره. As a side note, the legislative irada is better explained as legislative wish or want because it's what Allah سبحانه وتعالى loves. Whereas the universal one is better translated as will in the sense that it's going to happen uh, no matter what. One may wonder. If Allah loves for something to occur, why does it not occur? If one of us loves something and is able to do it, he would do it. And Allah is over all things competent. So why does what Allah doesn't love happen even though he is able to do otherwise? The answer to this is that Allah does all things for a certain wisdom. Allah may love something in and of itself or he may love something due to its implications, the wisdom meaning the wisdom behind it. Kufr is not something which Allah wishes in His legislation, but it is something that He wills universally. That is because the occurrence of Kufr has many great wisdoms and benefits which would not be so without it occurring. If everyone believed, then this world would have been spoiled. The same would be so if everyone disbelieved. So when there's belief and disbelief, there's going to be good eradicating evil, for example. That's one of the great wisdoms behind it. But it is from Allah's wisdom that He created us and that some of us are believers and others are disbelievers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly said this وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَجَعَلَ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً وَلَا يَزَلُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ إِلَّا مَرْحِمَ رَبُّكَ وَلِذَاكَ خَلَقَهُمْ And if your Lord had willed, He would have made mankind one community, but they would not cease to differ except for, for the, whom your Lord has given mercy. And it is for this reason that Allah created them, so that they differ. This is Allah's wisdom. وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ لَأَمْلَأَنَّ جَهَنَّمَ this continues in the same verses in Surah Hud. But the word of your Lord is to be fulfilled that what? I will surely fill hell with jinn and men altogether. So without this, Allah's word, or meaning that if, 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 the, if the people didn't have differences between each other and there's people that differ between truth and falsehood, without this, Allah's word or his saying, his statement, I will surely fill hell with jinn and men altogether would not have been fulfilled. So this thing, which is disliked by Allah in terms of legislative wish, but occurs universally, his wisdom dictates that it occurs. So Allah loves it, not in and of itself, but due to the great benefits that come from it, which Allah wants in terms of legislation. So one should not be deceived by those who claim that describing Allah as willing what he does not like means that Allah is somehow incapable. They will ask, فَكَيْفَ يَقْعُ مَا لَا يُرِيدْ how is, how is it that something occurs which Allah does not want? The answer is that it occurs due to the wisdom and behind it and benefits. يَقْعُ ذَلِكَ لِمَا يَتَرَتَّبْ عَلَيْهِ مِنَ الْحَكِمِ وَالْمَصَالِحِ Imagine one has a son who is afflicted with a disease which is curable by cauterization, using heat to, to cure it. 
the father would treat his son while hurting him or hating to hurt him. But there is a benefit behind the pain, which is the cure. And to Allah belongs al-mathal al the highest of attributes and examples and analogies. The sensible person knows that Allah's wisdom is higher than ours, and we cannot apply our wisdom to his wisdom. He has great wisdom and secrets behind what he decrees. So much so that in a hadith Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَا تَرَدَّدْتُ عَنْ شَيْءٍ أَنَا فَاعِلُهُ تَرَدُّدِي عَنْ قَبْضِي نَفْسِ عَبْدِي الْمُؤْمِنِ uh, يَكْرَهُ الْمَوْتَ وَأَكْرَهُ إِسَاءَتَهُ وَلَا بُدَّ لَهُ مِنْهُ I have not hesitated about anything I do as I hesitate about taking the soul of a believer who dislikes death. For I dislike grieving him, but he cannot escape it, meaning death is going to happen. This shows that Allah decrees matters which he does not like, but for great wisdoms, the Hakam al baligha. So taking away the soul and causing grief to the slave is something not liked in and of itself by Allah, but Allah loves the outcomes of it. The outcomes of it, in Asluha Lisa إلى Allah. نفس المراد غير محبوب لكن ما يترتب عليه من مصالح هو المحبوب what benefits come out of it Allah does not like disobedience but due to disobedience jihad in the way of Allah is upheld as is enjoining what is good and forbidding what is evil and man would not have been tested without this we would we do not encompass all of Allah's wisdom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وما أتيته من العلم إلا قليلا and mankind have not been given of knowledge except a little there is wisdom behind all of Allah's actions it is not always based on our perception of wisdom. If all of mankind gathered to find the wisdom in every ruling in the divine texts, they would not be able to. They would not be able to do that. Some of the legislation is not in line with, with some people's logic. As for the part in the hadith, مَا تَرَدَّتُ عَنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا تَرَدُّذِي In the hadith Qudsi meaning, I have not hesitated about anything uh, I do as I hesitate. Then the apparent wording has caused many people some confusion. But when one ponders it, there is there are no issues at all. Hesitation has two causes. First, that the doer of the action is unsure or ignorant of the outcome of his action. So he hesitates from doing it. The second one is that the action is based upon knowledge that he knows what's going to happen. But the hesitation is out of mercy. So one hesitates but still does it, does it anyway. Just as the example of cauterization that we explained earlier or any cure that hurts but ultimately cures. Uh, so the hesitation which Allah is exalted above is one which is based on ignorance. يعني فالتردد الذي نزه الله عز وجل التردد الذي سببه الجهل. In this case, one is not sure whether to do something or not. On the other hand, hesitation with full knowledge of the outcome due to mercy, for example, then this is not something negated from Allah because it is part of His complete mercy. That is why Allah said عن قبض نفسي Abdi al Mu'min about taking the soul of a believer of, of my slave my believing slave. It is not applicable to all slaves because it's a special mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about that Wakana Bil Mu'min Rahima and ever is he to the believers merciful. This is a special mercy for the believers. This is similar to amazement, the attribute of amaz the action of amazement on the part of Allah. One 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 mode of recitation, for example, is Bal Ajibtu Yaskharun. Uh, we know that it's bal ajibta, meaning, but you wonder, O Muhammad, وسلم, while they mock. But another mode of recitation is bal ajibtu. Ajibtu means, um, but I wonder, meaning Allah's talking about Himself, but I wonder, meaning Allah's amazed by this while they mock. And we have a hadith also in uh, Ibn Majah and, and others. Ajib rabbuna min qunuti ibadihi wa qurbi ghiyarihi. Our Lord is amazed at the despair. Of his slaves, although he soon changes it. And the one Ibn Majah says, "Dahika Rabbuna min qunuti ibadi wa qurbi ghiyarihi." Our Lord laughs, Subhanahu wa Taala, at the despair of his slaves, although he soon changes it. The beautiful hadith, when you go to it, one of them will say that we are not going to have any problems or any issues because of a Lord. We have a Lord that laughs, Subhanahu wa Taala, in a way, of course, that befits His Majesty. Some people rejected al-ajab for Allah, amazement for Allah, because they say it implies that Allah is ignorant. Now, human being is amazed because he, he sees a matter which he was ignorant of. Like, wow, what's going on, right? However, the attribute of amazement is this is dependent upon, as to who it is attributed. So don't think of an attribute immediately as, uh, as a, as a one-way attribute. It depends on who you are talking about. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basir. We are also basir. We see, he sees. But this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeing. It's not like us seeing. Similar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, it took me al-idda. And wants for you to complete the period. The letter wow, wa, took me al-idda is a coordinating conjunction, it's atifa, harfu atf. And the lam in litukmilu is to show the reasoning 
meaning it's lam at ta'lil because the other lam at times might be for uh, might be for um, reasoning or it might be for showing a command for showing a command which is called lam al amr the evidence that it is the lam for giving the reason is that there is a kasra below it li li tukmilu had it been for command then it would have a sukun it would have been silent and the letter wow connected between al yusra and wa tukmilu al idda al yusra is al ma'tufu alayh al ma'tufu alayh so it means yuridu allah bikum al yusra wa la yuridu bikum al usra wa yuridu Allah wants ease for you and not hardship so that you complete because he wants you to complete uh, the period and the letter lam with the verb arada is an additional particle in terms of the meaning it is because the verb arada on its own affects what comes after it for example يريد الله ليبين لكم الله says معناه يريد الله أن يبين لكم الله wants to make clear to you in سورة النساء this is where the the the, the letter lam comes after a derivative of the word إرادة so in the verse we are discussing وتكمل العدة يعني وتكمل العدة يعني يريد الله منا شرعا that Allah wants this from us in the terms of the legislation two modes of recitation but one meaning we have what tukmilu fiha qira'atan tukmilu bit takhfif wa tukammilu bit tajdid huma bi'ana wahid so if you say tukmilu wa tukammilu they be they, they have the same meaning but they're just different modes of recitation wa li tukmilu idda some scholars took from this that it does not say wa li tukmilu idda tashahr that is in order to complete the period of a month it just says the period wa li tukmilu idda it doesn't say idda tashahr the, the period of a month so those scholars derive from this that in some regions such as polar regions like we said earlier circles in which they don't have months um, so it means that they complete the number of days of Ramadan based on the timing of other regions the number of days to make up a month because in those regions they don't have months in هذا من آيات القرآن أن أنه جاء التعبير صالحا حتى لهذه الحالة التي ما كانت معلومة عند الناس حين نزل القرآن so they said that this is from the signs and miracles of the Quran that this articulation, this ta'bir, was revealed at a time in which the situation of some people was not known to the people during the time of the revelation. So it took me al-idda to complete the, the period, or the, or the days basically. And the al-idda being mentioned without a month is also of benefit because it might not be a full month, but 29 days instead of instead of 30. What it took me Allah, and we have what it took me to be harf al-jar, معطوف على ويتكبر ويتكبر الله الواو حرف عطف ويتكبر معطوف على ويتكمل بعدة حرف الجر and to glorify Allah the letter wow is used again as a coordinating conjunction and it connects with what came before it which is ويتكمل that you complete the period ويتكبر الله and to glorify Allah it means to say Allahu Akbar the takbir and it encompasses uh, takbir of Allah encompasses al, 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 pri the pride, magnificence, and abstract matters. Yeah, al umur al It also includes al umur al things to do with His essence, Subhanahu wa Taala. That's why we have a hadith: "Masamat al sabr wal adun al sabr wa ma fihna ma ma bainhuna fi yadi al rahmani illa kahrdat fi yadi ahadikum." The seven heavens and the seven earths and whatever is in them, and between them, in the palm of al Rahman, is no more than a mustard seed in one of your palms. Allah, you know, this is a narration in Al-Tabari um, and it's an authentic with an authentic chain going back to Abdullah ibn Abbas for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a'adham wa kulli shay wa akbar wa kulli shay Allah is greater and more magnificent than everything wa tukabbir Allah ala mahadakum ala the word ala qila innaha lit-ta'lil inna ala huna lit-ta'lil wa lisat lil-isti'la ay li tukabbiruhu li hidayatikum and to glorify Allah for, for that to which he has guided you the word ala translated as for is said to be used for reasoning to give the ta'liya the reasoning for it not for superiority and transcendence that is to glorify Allah for the reason that he guided you to glorify Allah for the reason that he guided you and the word ala was used instead of the letter lam so it says ala mahadakum not li mahadakum it is to show that the, the, this takbir comes at the end it is trans it is transcendent above what has occurred of guidance because what comes last is the most elevated it is like someone filling a plate of food. Whatever he puts last on it, on uh, last is on is on the highest part of the plate. So the takbir comes at the end, 
um, when this guidance is completed, do to do the fasting, to complete the fasting. So the word ala is for two reasons, at ta'lil to give reasoning, similar to the letter lam. And the second is that it is an indication that the takbir occurs after the completion of this guidance. That is where the takbir starts at the sunset time on the last day of Ramadan, which be, which begins the first day of Eid, meaning the first day of Shawwal. Ala ma hadakum, the word ma is either masdariya or mausula. It is either sourced on its own masdariya or it connects things mausula. If it is mausula, then it requires a, a, what we call a'aid, something that returns to it. If it is masdariya, then it does not require a'aid. In the case of it being mausula, connected, it would have an omitted a'aid. It would be ala ma hadakum bihi, for that. And that's why they have in square brackets in English to which he has guided, not from that which he has guided to which, and that's bihi. The word bihi would be estimated or at taqdir or other words such as um, bihi or alayhi or lahu uh, instead of the word bihi. And it is known that if it is possible not to resort, to not resort to estimating a word in the verse, then that takes more priority, just taking the apparent verse as it is. So what is correct is that ma is masdariya, it stands on its own, so it would be ala uh, hidayatukum, you know, on your guidance. Otherwise, if the ma is mausula, then it would be ala ma hadakum lahu, ala ladhi hadakum lahu wa huwa siyam, to that which he has to that which he has guided you, namely uh, fasting. Ala ma hadakum, hadi hidayat ashmul hidayat al ilmi wa hidayat al amal. The guidance here encompasses both the guidance of knowledge and the guidance of acting upon that knowledge. وهي التي يعبر عنها أحيانا بهداية الإرشاد وهداية التوفيق and sometimes it, it, it is explained as guidance to show uh, the direction and the other is guidance to be successful when one fasts Ramadan and completes it then there's no doubt that Allah favored him with both types of guidance the guidance of knowledge and the guidance of acting upon the knowledge يعني هداية العلم وهداية العمل يعني هداية الإرشاد وهداية التوفيق ولتكبر الله على ما هداكم here the action is concluded with takbir and not istighfar even though many acts of worship are concluded with istighfar, we know when we finish the prayer, we say astaghfirullah three times after prayer. It is as if when the fasting has been completed and concluded, a person that feels you know, elevated of a, of a high status, it is, uh, it is like how if one is going up a high place like a mountain, he would say the takbir, he would, he would say Allahu Akbar, and if he's on a lower earth, he would do tasbih. We have a, a narration here, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا قفل من غزو أو حجة أو حج أو عمرة يكبر على كل شرف من الأرض ثلاثة تكبيرات. When God's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم returned from an expedition, a Hajj or an Umrah, on everything, on every rising piece of ground, if they went up, he would say three times, "Allah Akbar." God is the most great. So they don't think that you're high, high, and your ilas Allah is greater than anything else that you did, and what you're and greater than you for sure. We have another hadith that says uh, one, of the one of the companions said كُنَّا إِذَا صَعِدْنَا كَبَّرْنَا وَإِذَا نَزَلْنَا سَبَّحْنَا When they went up to high ground they said Allahu Akbar and when they descended they said Subhanallah because you know when you're in a low, a low part you elevate Allah above any deficiency because you're, you're in a low part of the earth. So it is, if, it, is, um, it is as if by one completing the fasting of Ramadan and catching the net of Qadr he felt of a high status. So that is why Allah said ala ma hadakum in the sense that ala is for al istila that what Allah has favored us of guidance is of a high status and Allah is greater than all. وَلَعَلَكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ أَيْ تَقُومُونَ بِشُكْرِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَلَعَلَّ هُنَّ لِلْتَعْلِيلِ And perhaps you will be grateful and the word la'allah here is for reasoning. Showing gratitude for four things. What is this gratitude for? وَلَعَلَكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ Allah's will to make matters easy on us and His will of not wanting to make things difficult. That's two things. Completing the term of fasting. Three things in the takbir for guiding us. That's the fourth thing. All such things are favors that warrant us showing gratitude to Allah. There is hamd, we, we call it praise, and shukr, which is gratitude. Now, they are not synonymous. Hamd is more general as far as the reason or the cause to do it. And shukr is more general in terms of how it is done. The reason for hamd is the perfection and favor of the one who is praised. But it is done by the tongue, by, by saying it specific specific by speaking it but the cause for shukr is one thing which is the favors and one does not thank someone for his perfection but he thanks him for his favors but the way shukr is done is more general it is done by speech by saying it by the heart 
within yourself and by the actions of the limbs so it is three pillars showing gratitude in terms of actions has to do with what Allah has legislated in the respective favors so showing gratitude for wealth is by paying the zakah for example and spending what is incumbent upon you it is also to spend on oneself in the way that Allah legislated such as nice clothing and the like in a hadith the messenger sallallahu said man an'ama Allahu alayhi bi ni'matin fa inna Allah yuhibbu an yura athara ni'matihi ala 'abdi if god shows favor to anyone he likes the mark of his favor to be seen on his servant so if the favor is knowledge if it's ilm then showing gratitude for it the, for that is to act upon that knowledge and to teach it to others fashukrun ni'ma an taqum bima shara'a Allah lak fiha showing gratitude for a favor is by using it in the way Allah has legislated so this is the specific type of gratitude as for the general gratitude it is to unrestrictedly obey the one who gave you the favors Imagine, so we have a man who was granted both wealth and knowledge, he spends in the proper ways, but is holding back regarding his knowledge. So this person is not given the title of shakir in the unrestricted mutlaq sense, but is shakir in a specific sense or in a restricted sense. He is shakir from one aspect but not shakir from another aspect. Because man has both good and evil, belief and disbelief, obedience and defiance, this is the way of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah in terms of uh, looking at an individual who would have sometimes different aspects of different things. If someone is afflicted with a trial, he does both hamd, praise, and shukr, gratitude as well. One would consider Allah's favor in terms of wiping out his sins, as of the trial that he's going through, and the elevation of status due to being patient with this trial, with the trials. And this is all a favor, so one does the shukr of Allah for that. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانٌ Beautiful verse. And when my servant asks you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, concerning me, indeed I am near, I respond to the invocation of the supplicant when he calls upon me, so let him respond to me by obedience and believe in me that they may be rightly guided. So the address here is to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he is at the means by which the revelation is delivered. And the address to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can either be specifically for him or it, may be, it might be general, so it applies to him and the Ummah, depending on the siyaq or the context. Ibadi, the word ibad is mudaf, what we call mudaf, what is added, and the letter ya, the attached pronoun, is mudafun ilay, that to which it is added. What is meant here are the believing slaves, and what proves this is, the next part of the verse, I respond to the invocation of the supplicant when he calls upon me. But the kuffar don't call unto Allah alone. They call unto others with Allah. So this is talking about the believers who only call to Allah. And when my servant asks you concerning me, the believing slaves are asking about Allah's closeness and answering supplication. As proven in the next part, Indeed I am near and respond to the invocation of the supplicant when he calls upon me. So it's on al-qurbi wal ijaba because the word anni, concerning me or about me, could be of many different meanings, be it Allah's essence, His names, His attributes, His graciousness, and so on. إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي When my, servant asks, my servants ask you, does it mean they already asked? Or does this mean they will ask? Or does it mean that if they ask, then tell them that I am near and will answer? It is the second and third. It is that they have not already asked, that they, that they, that they are going to ask. And it includes that if they will ask to give them the answer regarding their questions about Allah. So it means they will ask and it means that if they do, this will happen. The hadith is, an Arabian qal, uh, there's a hadith in this regard. Ya Rasulullah, aqaribun rabbuna funanajiyahu, am ba'idun funanadiyahu. Fa'an zallah azza wa jalla, wa idha salak ibadi anni fa'anni qarib. The Messenger sallallahu was asked, is our Lord near so that we would whisper to him? Or is he far so that we call on to him loudly? And nida awul munaja. So on this occasion, the verse was revealed. But this narration has been declared weak by many scholars. But some of them used it as evidence, such as Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah. So according to him, it is an evidence. At least it is of a Hassan grade, according to him. But many scholars of hadith declared it to be weak. And the context of the verse does not indicate that it is the reason for the revelation of, of, for, for revelation of that hadith. Had it been so, then the verse would have been similar to many other, other ones which come in the present tense. And they ask you. 
about orphans. So say improvement for them is best. They ask you and they ask you about menstruation. They ask you, O Muhammad وسلم, what has been made law for, for them? فيأتي بصيغة المضارع الدالة على الوقوع لا بصيغة الماضي المعلق بالشرط فإن الماضي المعلق بالشرط يدل على عدم وقوع ذلك الشيء All of those verses and others similar to them uh, are in the present tense so it proves that something has occurred not in the past tense in the structure of a conditional if statement فإن الماضي المعلق بالشرط يدل على عدم وقوع ذلك الشيء as we mentioned an if statement in the past tense showed that something did not occur as of yet لكن هل يدل على أنه سيقع أو على فرض أن يقع But does it mean that it will occur or does it mean in case it occurs meaning it may or may not The scholars of the language said that uh, إذا and إن كلاهما شرطيتان Both particles إذا and إن are conditional are conditional But إن but إن does not indicate that something will occur لكن إن لا تدل على الوقوع قد تعلق بأمر ممتنع غاية الامتناع It might be attached to something that is totally impossible بخلاف إذا فإن تدل على الوقوع That is different from the word إذا Which points to something occurring For example, we say إذا جاء زيد فأكرمه When زيد comes, honor him Notice how the translation of إذا is when Because when something will happen means it will happen It hasn't happened yet In this case, it means he will come But you would, uh, but you would honor him when he does come And, and, this is, and that he will come but if instead it's uh, but if instead of that it is in جَاءَ زَيْدٌ فَأَكْرِمْهُ هذا يدل على أنه قد يأتي وقد لا يأتي. If we say instead of when Zayd comes, we say if Zayd comes, then honor him. This would mean that he may or may not come. ف- so in this verse, for this verse, إذا سألك ظاهرها أن السؤال منهم متوقع. So this verse and when my servant asks you, apparently shows that the question from them will come and is expected. It hasn't already happened yet. It will come. But inna, meaning if, could be attached to something completely negated from happening. One example is Allah's statement regarding himself and so to Zuhruf. قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ لِلْرَحْمَنِ وَلَدٌ فَأَنَا أَوَلُ الْعَابِدِينَ Say, O Muhammad وسلم, if the Most Merciful had a son, then I would be the first of his worshippers. And this is not possible, impossible for Allah to have a son. And Allah's statement regarding the Messenger وسلم, لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ لَإِنَّ so There's inna right there. If you should associate anything with Allah, your work would surely become worthless. Now, can we imagine the Messenger of Allah being a mushrik? لا يمكن أبدا. حاشا وكلا. But there's also a context of the word inna when uh, in, عفوان, uh, if, if it's something that may or may not occur. For example, in Surah An-Nisa, it says, it talks, uh, we have something about inheritance. وَلَكُمْ نِصْفُ مَا تَرَكَ أَزْوَاجِكُمْ إِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُنَّ وَلَدٌ فَإِنْ كَانْ لَهُنَّ وَلَدٌ فَلَكُمُ الرُّبْعُ مِمَّا تَرَكُمْ And for you is half of what your wives leave if they have no child. But if they have a child, for you is one-fourth of what they leave. So the word, so here the word in is used for something which may occur or may not occur. In this context, it's something for yes or no. Not for something impossible like it's used, like it was used in Surah Al Zukhruf, as we mentioned earlier. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika, ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.